Hello and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insight from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collections held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit rackley.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Stephen Phelps. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Harvard Radcliffe Institute Fellow Stephen Phelps. He is a professor of integrative biology and the director of the Center for Brain, Behavior and Evolution at the University of Texas, Austin. As an evolutionary neurobiologist, he blends molecular neuroscience with behavioral ecology to understand natural diversity in social cognition. His research explores why individuals and species differ in their social behavior, advancing a uniquely interdisciplinary perspective on the biology of sexual and social intimacies. Professor Phelps is well known for his deep research on the AVPR1A gene in the prairie vole. This Midwestern rodent is monogamous and form pair bonds. Professor Phelps has identified genetic variation in memory circuits that allows for some prairie voles to be more faithful than others. Furthermore, he utilizes his knowledge in genetics, neurobiology, and behavior to write and speak about the intersection of science and society. He is, a gif he's, he is gifted at communicating science to the public through his popular articles, which have been featured in Ian, The Atlantic, New York Times, and many other outlets in the US and abroad. In 2019 alone, Professor Phelps had an op-ed in the New York Times about genetic studies of human sexuality and an insightful essay on touch and intimacy in the magazine Ian. At Radcliffe, Professor Phelps is putting his diverse skills to, the, to use by synthesizing perspectives from evolutionary biology, neuroscience, social psychology, and personal experience to explore the biology of intimacy. Social psychologists support that bonds are essential to our well-being. One recent meta-analysis indicates that the health toll of chronic Ill loneliness is comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Indeed, over the course of the pandemic, we have been reminded of the importance of intimate bonds for the well-being of ourselves and society at large. Professor Phelps' book will draw examples from the natural history and human culture to illustrate why we and other species form attachments across life's, the lifespan. Professor Phelps received his PhD in zoology from the University of Texas at Austin, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Science Foundation Center for Behavioral Neuroscience and the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. He is a founding member and president of the Society for Social Neuroscience and was named a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow. His work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, National Geographic, and the National Institute of Health. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Stephen Phelps. Thank you, Claudia. Well, thank you so much for being here today in this necessarily less than intimate setting to hear me talk about the biology of intimacy. As Claudia mentioned, I'm an evolutionary neurobiologist, and I'm interested in the diversity of animal behavior and its neural and hormonal mechanisms. And through my work on one species, the prairie vole, I've come to study bonding, like many scientists here in the US. I've also become interested in what animal studies have to tell us about the human experience. And so during today's talk, I may slip from time to time from what we know into a more expansive, more speculative view on intimacy and relationships. And I hope that when, you, when I do, that you'll indulge me for a moment. Intimacy is at its heart a kind of closeness. When we touch our intimate companions, 
In fact, our nervous systems have receptors, sensory cells or neurons that reside in the surface of our skin. They're tuned to the depth and pace of caress, tuned even to the heat of another body. So that when we're touched in just the right way, we feel good. And we're intimate in other ways. We speak softly to each other. We feel in some way connected. We become angry if a partner is angry and feel joy with their joy. Psychologists, in fact, sometimes speak of love as a kind of expansion of self, an inclusion of another person in our notion of who we are. When we're apart from loved ones, we often ache for them, and with good reason. Our social connections are essential to our health. As Claudia mentioned, chronic loneliness can be as devastating as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And there's hardly anything more protective than a healthy marriage. So in a sense, we feel intimacy very deeply and it feels like something, something that, that's in our bones in, in a way that I will say is, is almost literal. One of my favorite things to do when I go to Washington DC is to, to visit the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And one of the things I love to do there is to see this particular specimen known as Shanadar 1. So Shanadar 1 is a Neanderthal, about 40 years old, which is quite old for a Neanderthal. And his left skull had been broken, damaging his eye socket and presumably limiting his vision. His ear canals are somewhat occluded, so he must have had a hard time hearing. And this injury seems to have occurred at a young age because his skull is fully healed. And his motor performance must have been impaired because his right arm, as you can see here on the left side of these two uh, humeri, is withered with dis disuse. And it suggests that he was a member of a community that somehow cared for him and allowed him to help him to live to this older age. And he's not the only example. We can look back even further in a less dramatic way to uh, this famous sample from Homo erectus. Uh, one of the skulls from Damanisi, Georgia, which is almost 2 million years old. And what you'll see about this right away, I think, is if you look at the teeth and gums of the specimen, that this is an old man. This is somebody who lived to quite an old age um, at a time when we're not yet human. We see, other, these, we see similar kinds of things in other primates and the skeletons of a chimpanzee or a lemur. And we can see this history of care in another way too, in the behavior of species that are alive today, species who share some large fraction of our genome with us, whose DNA is very similar to our own. So here, for example, is a silhouette, a photograph taken um, by a young Franz de Waal of two chimpanzees who have fought and are reconciling as one extends his hand to the other. And the, the notion that chimpanzees reconcile uh, is kind of one of many insights into emotional behavior in animals that, that uh, Dr. Duvall has, has given us. We see all kinds of other interesting things in chimpanzees. There are chimpanzees who adopted orphans or seem to grieve for their dead, who form what look like friendships. Shown here are two young males photographed by my colleague Aaron Sandell at UT Austin. They groom one another, they take leave with one another from their smaller groups, and perhaps one day as adults they'll form an alliance together or hunt together and then it really looks like a bond in many respects. So it's almost impossible, I think, to talk scientifically about caring and intimacy without also talking about bonding. So what is a bond? A bond I'll define as a behaviorally as a specific relationship between two individuals that's defined by mutual approach and mutual support. Bonded individuals share emotional or affective responses. The state of one individual influences another. What makes this bond interesting in part is how familiar it seems to us. But another is the fact that many species don't form bonds at all. Even among the great apes, for example, they orang as solitary and there are presumably bonds between mother and infant, but none between adult sexual partners, nothing that, that resembles friendship. Bonds are not inherently necessary. In fact, among mammals, fewer than one in 10 species form pair bonds. And we can contrast that with birds in which only one in 10 species fails to form pair bonds. Social monogamy, that is the, the, the living of males and females together to raise young, is the rule, not the exception in, in other groups of organisms. And maybe this is one of the reasons that birds and their social relationships have long fascinated, uh, fascinated us as biologists. You've probably seen these miraculous flocks 
uh, the serpentine and looping aggregations of birds that number easily into the tens of thousands or, or more. I remember seeing them as a teenager in Southern Illinois when my mother and I would glean corn uh, to feed our horses. And then I remember seeing them again and writing them about them a bit as a postdoc when I was out trapping prairie voles in the flat land of Champaign County in central Illinois. Well, the, these looping strange aggregations are just really deeply and inherently fascinating and they have been for a very long time. In fact, one of my favorite more colorful examples comes from the animal behaviorist and ornithologist Edmund Silas, who in 1931 wrote a book in which he posited that these fluid, almost purposeful movements of the flocks, the nearly instantaneous ascent and landing that are required a kind of ESP. And in fact, he titled his book rather colorfully, Thought Transference or What in Birds. So today we don't think that these flocks require ESP. And there's a whole group of uh, different uh, scholars who study the collective behavior of animals to try to understand how the rules of individuals lead to the rule to the behavior and performance of groups. And uh, while I find these huge flocks still captivating, as you probably do, um, I'm increasingly drawn to smaller flocks, flocks in which you can follow individual birds. Um, I, if you're walking out and about and notice them, if you notice a bird, you'll almost always notice that that bird is not alone. There's almost always a companion with that bird. These are images of jackdaws, a crow-like bird that lives in Europe, and that uh, a physicist at Stanford, Nick Ouellette, and his lab have done some work on. And these are images from one of their papers. And what they did was they, they did tracking of these birds and their movements in these large groups. And one of the things they found that I thought was so fascinating was that to make sense of their movements, you had to account for the bonds between pairs. These bonds are represented mathematically as a kind of binding of the two, the connection between these two individuals with the spring. So I think that's kind of also a lovely metaphor of our relationships with one another and the sense that our attachments to one another could almost have a kind of mathematical precision, even in the absence of a physical, literal connection. Well, these images I mentioned are jackdaws, the small crow-like bird. And one of the reasons that they're interesting uh, as a study subject is they were also a major study subject for one of the first people to think very deeply about the relationships among uh, individual birds. And this is Conrad Lorenz. In 1935, in his monograph, translated, whose title is translated as Companions as Factors in the Bird's Environment, he wrote extensively about jackdaws and their social relationships, talked about their specific relationships as kind of buddies. But he's really most famous for, the, for his work in Grey Lake Geese, which he also discusses in the same monograph. These are geese that leave the nest really early and have a very narrow, uh, very narrow window in which to learn the identity of their parents. So they quickly form a memory of the first thing that moves. And in nature, the first thing that moves is always the parent. But what Lorenz realized is that by rearing eggs in an incubator and being present and hatching, that the goslings would imprint on him. They would follow him around. And these are adult, uh, uh, of, these are adult animals here that, uh, that have imprinted on him. And they'll follow, they would follow him around his farm, they would swim with him, and they seem to form some kind of lasting attachment to him based on that brief window of experience. Well, the intellectual significance of this work is that Lorenz really was the first to sort of emphasize that the natural history of an animal shaped its mind. That behavior patterns could be thought of as almost like organs that were shaped by natural selection. And so when we look across the animal kingdom at the diversity of bonding and the fact that some species form bonds and some don't, and the character of those bonds can vary, well, that suggests those bonds might serve some purpose and they might be functional in some interesting way. And this has become something that I'm very, really quite fascinated by. In general, I think bonds form when two individuals share an interest. And the easiest way to share an interest is through relatedness. This is presumably why parent offspring bonds are among the most common bonds that we see in the natural world. In poison frogs like this, uh, <clears throat> like this individual I'm showing here, males often carry, they have a very small clutch of eggs, unusual for frogs. And, married, and males often carry tadpoles on their backs. Um, and so this is a Peruvian frog. And he, what he's doing is he's taking this tadpole here and he's going to carry him up to a bromeliad. 
And he's going to deposit this tadpole in a bromeliad, where, where the tadpole is going to grow up safe from aquatic shrimp and other potential predators that would be present if you put them in water on the ground. Uh, and so he can eat uh, some you know, aquatic insect larvae or other things that are in the bromeliad with him. But dad comes back every couple of days just to check on him. And roughly once a week, the male decides that his young needs more food than he can find there in the bromeliad. And so he calls out from the pool this soft call. And that call is a call to his mate. And so that's the male in the upper right. And you can see his, his little, um, his little um, uh, throat sack that, uh, that he uses to call with. And the female comes in response to the call and deposits an unfertilized egg for the tadpole to eat. And if you remove either the male or the female, the tadpole grows more, more, uh, more slowly and is less likely to survive. So this partnership of male and female uh, together with their relationship to their young shows many of the kinds of aspects of intimacy we might expect to see in our own species. We see this in lots of other species. Uh, pipefish uh, are related to seahorses, and like seahorses, they have a kind of what we think of as a sexual reversal in which males provide extensive care. They even incubate the eggs. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, though, the male can't do it alone. And when that's the case, he needs to partner with the female. And so in this case, this pipefish, uh, these, uh, these two will share both in parental care and territory defense. So often when we see romantic-like bonds, pair bonds, they seem to sort of serve some function specifically in the shared interest in the successful development of young. And so I've come to think of a, of a bond as a kind of pact between two minds. It's a bet that as the pair encounters the challenges and opportunities the world has to offer, that they'll do better if they stick together. But how could such a bond ever work? How would you build something like that if you were designing a brain or a mind? Well, to do that, we study a model species that we call the prairie vole, and many labs study the prairie vole now in the US. And they've been studying them since the 70s when researchers at the University of Illinois who were working on the ecology of the species, noticed that when they put out traps, males and females were often caught together. The same males and females were often caught together in the traps. And so they thought that they might actually be monogamous and form pair bonds. Work by, this was <clears throat> Lowell Getz, and then work by Sue Carter, who was then at the University of Illinois as well, began to look at the hormonal mechanisms. And then Tom Insel and other folks uh, uh, joined in soon after and brought increasing neural, uh, uh, neural approaches. And today, they've become this really spectacular um, model for understanding in tremendous precision and detail exactly how a bond can form. Well, they form bonds, like many species, by an extended period of exclusive mating. And that extended repeated mating is really essential to the formation of a bond. During uh, this period, they will uh, vocalize and groom each other. And so uh, my, my postdoc, Morgan, is working on the functions of these vocalizations and pair bond formation. And she finds that there are different kinds of vocalizations. There are vocalizations that look like courtship vocalizations that are specific to uh, when the animals are mating. And then there are other kinds of vocalizations um, that, uh, that's, that occur when the individuals are far apart from one another, that look more like something we might consider a, a contact call. They exhibit reunion behaviors. If you take animals apart and put them back together, they groom each other and vocalize. They can fall out of love. If pairs have been separated for more than 10 days, they'll be ready to form a new bond. And then lastly, they show really profound individual differences in the wild. And so all of these make them a really kind of rich source for thinking about how bonds form and for exploring it scientifically. So one of the first kinds of insights into how bonds form came from the study of the distribution of neuropeptide receptors in the brains of prey bulls. So I'm showing here just a kind of fun colorized image uh, that's a cross section of a brain in which uh, the brain has been stained for the abundance of a neuropeptide receptor. And that neuropeptide receptor binds to the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin, you may have heard of as a kind of love hormone. Of course, it's in reality a little more complicated than that, but it, but it does seem very important for the formation of bonds. 
And uh, uh, what uh, Tom Insel and others noticed was that when you compared the distribution of these uh, hormone receptors in the brains to other closely related species that don't form bonds, we see that these receptors are, are concentrated in parts of the brain that are important for reward, for things that make us feel good. And it's as though we've taken the normal things of the, that make us feel good about social interaction and then just ramped them up to allow a, an almost kind of addiction to form that, that looks like uh, what we call a bond. Oxytocin gets released uh, at birth and during milk letdown and presumably shapes bonding or well, is known to shape bonding in many mammal species uh, in response to touch. Um, we, we get oxytocin released when we look in the eyes of a dog. Uh, in a, in a, uh, well, one of our dogs, and, and thankfully they do too. So oxytocin seems to play a role in a diverse range of bonds, and it's thought to do so in particular through these reward centers. If you inf infuse oxytocin directly into one of these reward centers, like this uh, area here shown in blue, that's the nucleus accumbens, if you put oxytocin there, you can, form, you can cause a prairie vole to form bonds in the absence of mating. And if you block oxytocin there, you can prevent the formation of bonds, although mating proceeds normally. Well, this is really one of the first concrete insights we had into how the brain could form a bond. And it led directly to work on humans. And so here's a study uh, that was done by Arthur Aaron and Helen Fisher and others. Um, and in it, they asked undergraduates to rate first how much they were in love with their partner. And then they show those undergraduates photos of their partner or photos of another opposite sex individual. And then they asked how much the, the, what areas of the brain lit up in response to seeing somebody you loved. And what they found was that these same areas, these reward areas, like the nucleus accumbens I just mentioned, um, were active when, uh, when viewing loved ones. And so uh, what we have now is a sense of a kind of circuit uh, for reward in which dopamine, um, the same compound that gets uh, particularly active uh, if you use cocaine or, or uh, other things, um, dopamine released by the brainstem, by the ventral tegmental area, acts in the nucleus accumbens and another area called the ventral pallidum to promote reward. And so this seems to be part of why being together feels good. Uh, in some more recent work, my colleague Zoe Donaldson did some really remarkable thing. Um, so she took uh, a protein that had been engineered, a gene that had been engineered to express a protein that lights up if the voltage changes. And so you can put that gene into neurons, and then you can put a microscope into the brain and visualize those light flashes, which are then telling you about the activity of the, of the neurons where the microscope is placed. And so we have here on the left, uh, a prairie who's got one of these microscopes. So what you can't see here is there's a very light cable to kind of help stabilize it as the animal moves around in a cage with an open top. And then here in the center is the actual image that you get from one of these mi microscopes. And on the right are traces which depict the amount of flashing, the amount of voltage change that's happening in each of the, uh, the neurons that they're recording from. And so when you do that all together, what they find is that there are a group of neurons within this reward circuit that are um, a group of neurons within this reward circuit that are active just before the animal decides to approach somebody. And that happens just before they approach a stranger, but it especially happens before they approach the partner. And, uh, and not only that, but the number of neurons that are active just before you approach a partner grows as the bond deepens. And so this seems to be a kind of very direct, very cellular level view on the formation of bonds and the representation uh, of a memory uh, and a positive association for an individual within, within the brain. So my own lab has done uh, some other work that also looks at the brain and its relationship to bonding. And we've looked in another brain region. I mentioned briefly that when I was a postdoc, I went out into the field in central Illinois to examine, how, to examine 
natural variation in prairie voles. And so what I did is I trapped them in places that they occur naturally. And I just examined how diverse their brains were, which was at the time kind of a strange thing to do. And, uh, and so this is a hole in, in a little trap here, a little live trap. And then here uh, in these two images, what we have here is just a, a cutaway of a frozen tissue section that's been stained, not for oxytocin, but for a different neuropeptide that's closely related that also plays an important role in bonding, uh, a peptide that's called vasopressin. And what shocked us though, was that even though these are the same species and they both express vasopressin here in a brain region called the thalamus, quite abundantly, uh, down here in the amygdala quite abundantly, they differed in how much, ox uh, how much vasopressin receptor was expressed in this cortical brain region called the retrosplenial cortex. Some animals had a lot of it, which is kind of characteristic of the species. Other animals didn't have any at all. And so we were really fascinated by that. And we found that um, when we looked at how animals use space in the wild and kind of natural settings, that some animals, so, so what I'm showing here on the X and Y axis are just dimensions of an outdoor enclosure that's open, the animals can live in natural conditions. And then on the Z axis, the up and down axis, the, the surface depicts the likelihood that I'll detect a given pair bonded male, the males are the subject of the study, uh, within the enclosure. And so you can see here that there are four pair bonded males. And then uh, the focal animal is the one with the solid surface, and these wire surfaces are other animal, other, other pair bonded males. And you can see this male is, uh, has a territory that is totally separate from the territories of other animals. But we found that that wasn't always the case, that there were some males that had territories that tended to intrude on the territories of other animals. So this male is intruding on his territory, intruding on that territory. And when we looked, what we found is that these males tended to mate only with their partner, where these, oops, excuse me, whereas these males uh, tended to be more likely to mate with somebody else. And their partners, in turn, were more likely to mate with somebody else. And so, uh, this guy, in fact, ended up siring young with a, with a female uh, partner uh, of this guy. And so we call these kinds of different strategies intrapair fertilization, so that is uh, animals conceived within the pair bond, or extrapair fertilization, so animals that are conceived outside the pair bond. And when we looked at the brains of these males, we found that the animals that were faithful, the males that were faithful, had brains of this type, and the males who were unfaithful had brains of that type. Um, and then we went on to then look very deeply to try and understand the basis for this, uh, the mechanistic basis for this brain variation. And we chased it down to about four base differences within the genome that reside within regulatory sequences that turn on or turn off the expression of this gene, specifically in the retrosplenial cortex. And we can do other kinds of things borrowed from evolutionary genetics to look at the pattern of DNA variation, and we can measure the fitness of the genes, the, the, the genetic variation that predicted uh, field variation. And all of this stuff together told us a really consistent story, that there are two ways to be successful as a male prairie bull. One involved being very faithful, and the other involves sometimes, uh, sometimes being not so faithful. And it looks like natural selection, far from thinking of one of these as a disease state, actually kept both of these uh, strategies around um, and seems, seems to have for a very long time. Well, now one of the things that my lab is doing is a little different. What we're now doing is trying to look um, on a whole brain scale at all of the circuits that are involved in bonding. That will presumably include, include these reward circuits, will presumably include this cortical region that we're so interested in. Um, but we'll probably include a lot of other things as well that we haven't really thought about. Because when you think about bonding, we have this, in the case of the variables, this repeated mating, cues about the individual, we've got the process of mating that somehow finds its way into the reward system and becomes a bond. Uh, and then that bond somehow uh, then serves to uh, buffer the animal against stress yeah, in a way that's much like our own, our own social buffering. How could that happen? And so we worked with Pavel Austin and Rodrigo uh, Castaneda Munoz, and the work in my lab was done by a postdoc, Morgan Gustafson, who's on the job market and is spectacular, <laughs> if anyone's looking for an amazing uh, young professor. And so what Morgan did was to systematically 
uh, introduce animals to each other, and then wait differing periods of time to allow them to mate uh, and, and form bonds. And those time periods corresponded to, to key points during bond development. First of all, we saw um, we had kind of a time zero, then we had two and a half hours, which is long enough to, to have mated quite a bit, but, uh, but not long enough to have formed a bond. By six hours, they're still mating, but bonds are forming. They're not yet kind of enduring. And then by 24 hours, those bonds have stabilized and the mating has stopped. And so she was able to, uh, to take animals at each of those points and compare them to various control groups. And then working with Pavel and Rodrigo, we developed a three-dimensional computational atlas of the preval brain. And what this atlas allowed to, us to do is to automate the imaging of an entire brain, and then go through and count every neuron that was active at one of those key time points. And then we can overlay that with this map of the brain. And it looks like an fMRI image, only it's much, much more uh, uh, resolved. It's at the resolution of individual cells. And so this is uh, some unpublished results from that. And what we see is a kind of pattern of circuits that first uh, recapitulate what's known about the circuits of sexual behavior and ejaculation in rodents, um, as well as these kind of reward circuits. And so we see how this information gets in and finds its way um, up into the brain. But we also see a bunch of other interesting things. We see other kinds of, of connections that occur between emotional centers like the amygdala and the hypothalamus that haven't been implicated in pair bonding before, but uh, are implicated in other kinds of social reward in other species. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about is as we kind of follow the circuit up, we find um, that one of the brain regions that seems to be most profoundly active as these bonds are forming in response to mating is a brain region that actively suppresses the stress response. And so what we think we're seeing is not only a map of how the, the nuances of touch and vocalization and all those other things that accompany mating find their way to the reward system in a bond. But we think we're also seeing how that then in turn comes, may, may come to suppress stress responses, which would give us some really new insights into how it is that bonds can buffer us against the, the travails of the world. So this isn't the first time that we've thought about how work in animals can influence humans. And I also want to mention that this, this work, you know, we, we find a remarkable relationship between not only these reward circuits, but circuits that are active in humans during orgasm based on, on fMRI studies, uh, fMRI studies in which people hold hands uh, with a partner and you can visualize the activity in their brain. And there's a really remarkable concordance across these really different species of the peripheral and, and ourselves in these brain circuits. But, um, but this isn't the first time that animal work has really led us into deep thinking about the nature of bonds. And I would say one of the first times and most, most uh, important times was when um, America <clears throat> was when researchers began to pay attention, researchers in psychology began to pay attention to the work of Conrad Lorenz. And his monograph on imprinting in geese led people like Harry Harlow, who, famous, who famously conducted these studies on the, the relationship between infants and mothers and rhesus macaques and the necessity of that, of that bond. And then work uh, among psychiatrists and psychotherapists like John Bowlby, a, a British man, who you know, was trained as a Freudian, um, but, uh, but found it lacking. And he also found lacking the very kind of dominant comparative psych ideas that uh, of a kind of tabula rasa in which our bonds with our parents, for example, or the love between a parent and a child was driven merely by warmth and by, and by food, which is, which is the thought predominant at the, at, in psychology circles at the time. So they had the kind of audacity to think about love as a kind of drive of its own. And that, was really, came, that really came directly out of these ideas of Lorenz. And so, uh, and so now, when we're focused on thinking about social relationships and how they, how they shape us and how important they are to us in the natural world, 
um, we can get a sense about how that might work. And, and, and certainly we see that it's something that's very deep that we see it across time that these bonds are essential. We, shown here are um, a pair of lovers buried in China, uh, recently discovered in Northern China from 1600 years ago. And the middle panel is a Bronze Age family from Siberia that were buried together. And on the right are the famous lovers uh, of Valdaro. And these, uh, these lovers uh, turn out to, be, to have been men. And so we see kind of the richness of our relationships to one another show up in the archaeological and fossil record as its own kind of, of record of care. And it, I think it really puts us in this deeper relationship to, to other species. And I, I, for one, at least find that deeper relationship um, to be rewarding and, and, and meaningful. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in the beginning of the talk, the psychologists sometimes talk about love as an expansion of self, by which they mean that we include a loved one in our conception of, uh, of our ego, of, of our identity. Uh, like the birds in the flock that I mentioned, some scientists are also starting to think about human bonds on a kind of continuum and recognizing that we feel closest to those with whom we have the most contact. So this is a, a graph I've reproduced from a, a review paper on friendship by Robin Dunbar here on the right. And, um, and it shows that, that we feel that our ratings of emotional closeness with one another re relate directly to our proximity to one another, to how often we're in contact with one another. And Dunbar goes on to suggest that we can, in fact, arrange uh, re relationships or think of relationships as a kind of nested series of what he calls altars of friendship that follow a power law. And at its base is the self. And you notice the number in the center circle is not a one, it's a 1.5. So the idea is that at our, you know, at our deepest level, we are together with another person in a way that is more than one individual and less than two. And I think there's something kind of poetic and really beautiful about that. I also really love this connection that we have to other species. Um, if we think about human bonds, the taxonomy of bonds, the ways that we've made sense of them over the years, in the Western tradition out of, out of ancient Greece, we have notions of different kinds of love, eros, storge, philia, agape, and they map kind of roughly onto these um, uh, notion that, onto really familiar notions, romantic partner, family, friendships, but they also map onto social groups that we can find in other organisms. In, other organisms. in fact, uh, I would argue that you could look into our history and find where it is in our lineage that those loves have an origin. And so this is a little, a little grand, but if you'll permit me. So Eros, the sexual love, you know, at some level, we know that there is a single origin in our lineage, uh, preceding our lineage, of the, uh, of the development of gametes, of sperm and eggs. And those are already in place by the time the first nervous systems evolved. So that suggests that the origin of Eros has at its base uh, might occur with the very beginnings of having any kind of brain whatsoever. We know that, uh, that parental care uh, familial love within our lineage dates to about 200 million years ago with the origins of, of, of early mammals. We could think of the origins of anthropoid primates and their friendships and relationships as being an origin of philia, not the only origins of these things necessarily, because there have been lots of kinds of bonds across the animal kingdom. But what I want to give a sense for is that our relationships are just a very deep part of who we are, that, that go much grand, that are, that, that shape us in a way that's much deeper than, than we can uh, surmise based on our recent culture. So these are uh, some of the people who've helped me do this work. This is a recent picture of my lab, slightly post, well, not post-pandemic, <laughs> in, a, in a window in which uh, we thought uh, we were safer than we were, uh, where uh, we went out to eat at a lovely Mexican restaurant. Um, and I want to acknowledge some other people who have been important here. Um, uh, on the right are people who have been in my lab, graduate students and postdocs for the most part, and then a couple collaborators in the lower right, um, arranged roughly in chronological order. 
And the bottom left there, I want to point out Morgan Gustafson, and she's the one who did uh, this whole brain imaging work together with these detailed analyses of, of prayerful bonding. And she did that in concert with Rodrigo uh, <clears throat> Munoz Castaneda at Cold Spring Harbor, who developed the, the pipeline or who developed the, the uh, three-dimensional atlas that we use. And he did that work in the lab of Pavel Austin, who's really an expert on this kind of automated whole brain uh, analyses. My funders have been uh, for the scientific work, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, my work this year is funded also by the UT University of Texas, uh, who gave me a research lead fellowship, as well of, as, of course, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and the Guggenheim Foundation, uh, which have given me some time and space to try and put together these different threads of, of work and, and make sense of them. So with that, I will stop and I will thank you for listening. Thank you, Stephen. This is extraordinarily fascinating. Thank you so much. And as you can imagine, there are lots of questions. So let me get going with those. The first one asks, do female prairie voles have any role in this faithfulness or are they completely passive in mating pair arrangements? Do they have any role in this faithfulness? Yeah. Uh, can you can you say the, sure. of the question? Do the female prairie voles oh, female have prairie. Yeah, any yeah. role in faithfulness, or are they passive uh, mating partners? Basically, yeah, no, no, they absolutely have every role, and um, and I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. That work was focused on males, for the reason that there's a, a sexual dimorphism in the expression of vasopressin within the brain, and there's a population of neurons that express vasopressin in males but not females. And this cortical structure seems to predict behavior in males, but doesn't predict behavior in females. So, um, so absolutely, you know, we just we're just, in that study. We're just looking at one little piece of it and focused on the males. But that's not to suggest that the females aren't at least equal contributors to those decisions. That's great. Um, the second question asks: How are pair bonds impacted by uh, the aging process? Uh, as we grow older, our hormone levels decrease and bonding seems to depend somewhat on these hormones. Does this make it harder for aging humans to find bonds of intimacy? Uh, you know, I don't think, I, I haven't seen any work that suggests that aging people or animals have trouble releasing oxytocin or vasopressin. Uh, you know, there are hormonal changes that happen with age. Of course, but um, but I don't think that um, I don't think that we have any trouble falling in love as we get older. Thankfully, may I add? <laughs> <laughs> um, have you found any epigenetic changes in the genome that correlate with differences in bonding behavior? Yes. So you know, we looked specifically at this brain variation that I mentioned, and in that brain variation, we were able to identify. We, we scanned in the vicinity of the vasopressin receptor gene and identified all the, all the variants in DNA that we could identify. And we asked among those variants, did any of them predict a brain pattern? And we found a set of four highly linked DNA variants that did predict the brain pattern. And then those four variants occurred in regions that were, um, that were important for gene regulation within this cortical structure. And then they also concentrate in that same region of the genome had kind of unusual statistical patterns where there's a lot more genetic variation at those spots in the genome than you would normally predict. And that's a, a classic kind of signature of what we call balancing selection when natural selection actively keeps multiple, multiple things around. So, so um, that brain variation in turn is associated with differences in monogamy in the field. Now, what we've been doing some in the lab is trying to understand the nature of that relationship. We've got a memory structure that's important, and, and it may be doing a couple different things. It may be shaping the acuity of their memory for space and for individuals within that space, which may translate into differences in bonding-like behavior or attachment or proximity-like behavior. Um, it may also be altering the precision or acuity of the memory for the partner. And we kind of have data that suggests both of those things are going on. That if you make a lesion to this part of the brain, the animals don't navigate in space. They're, they're very healthy and normal, but they don't navigate in space as efficiently as they, as they normally do. 
Uh, and if we temporarily inactivate this structure, we can obliterate the preferences for uh, one's partner in the lab, which suggests that part of it may actually be encoding the memory of, of, of a mate as well. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, in species that live in groups, is there evidence of policing or enforcing of pair bonds? And if so, are there likely to be qualitative differences in the pair bonds in these species compared to those that live in pairs? Does this uh, tell us anything about whether mate choice is important in the quality of pair bonds? Okay, so there are a couple things in that question. And certainly, I, I think, um, in general, we think of mate choice as being important for pair bonds because, uh, you know, if you allow animals to choose their own mates, they'll often, um, you know, those bonds may be more stable or less likely to be disrupted. I, I mean that in the abstract sense. We haven't done that exactly that experiment with prairie voles. Um, but uh, in terms of policing, now that, that's a really interesting question because I think, um, I think that kind of implies a level of culture that I don't expect to see in these animals. We do, you do see lots of an, uh, examples of policing behavior um, for individual relationships. And that's part of, uh, of how cooperation can work in an animal where you might sort of express um, uh, upsetness at a partner that's not doing something that you like uh, or might try to punish them in some way. Um, but we don't normally, I, I wouldn't expect to see that for a third party, um, uh, you know, which is really distinct from, say, how we might uh, feel about somebody in in uh, in human society. Right. Um, the next question is: um, If bonding is in part a buffer against stress, would you posit that non-bonding animals would have orthogonal stress buffers to pair bonders? Would I, would I hypothesize that what? So if you, do you want me to read the question again? Yeah, please. Okay, if bonding is a, part, is a buffer against stress, would you say that uh, non-bonding animals have um, orthogonal stress buffers to pair bonders? Well, I, I wouldn't say that non, and I'm not sure from the question if the, if the, um, if the author means, I'll open up my Q&A window here. I'm not sure from the question if the author means um, uh, comparing individuals within a species or if, um, or if um, the author means across species. But, but I will say that, that in a species in which bonds form, I think those bonds serve functions and that the, their ability to buffer us from stress isn't the point of the bonds. It's kind of not exactly. I, I think it's actually kind of the reverse. The, the point of a bond is to share risk. And if you don't share that risk, then you're more vulnerable. And those are and vulnerability elicits a stress response because stress is there to help us mobilize resources to a threat. And so when you're more threatened, you're kind of focused more on the immediate term. And that has lots of health consequences. But I think that I don't think the social, the, the buffering against stress is the function of bonds. I think it's a consequence of bonds. Right. Um, and it is fascinating to think about what that means for, for other species, for, for species that I think that species that don't form bonds don't need bonds. Mm -hmm. and, and so that they don't necessarily need alternative stress buffers. It's just that social relationships aren't as useful to them. Right, which actually leads us beautiful to the next question. It's very interesting. Uh, the, the listener asks, what about strong, long lasting partnerships that are also regularly stressful? <laughs> Is there research on those and you know, what, what's their function? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that's a, that is a, a good question. So on one hand, from the social psychology side, we know that a happy marriage is very protective, but an unhappy marriage is not. Um, the flip side of that is kind of from the behavioral ecology side that, you know, uh, when we enter into a relationship with somebody, you know, I, I say we in a very kind of inclusive sense of thinking about uh, other animals as well. Uh, when individuals enter into a relationship, um, you know, there's the hope that it will be useful, but the interests, while they're shared, they're not perfectly aligned. There's always some degree of conflict. Mm 
between what's best for you and what's best for your relationship partner. And so I think that's one of the reasons that bonds have these mechanisms in which we're constantly checking in with each other to see, to, you know, to, to, to communicate that we're still available in the partnership, but also to ask for affirmation that the partnership is still viable. And, you know, I think it's easy to imagine how that works in human relationships, but, um, but animal behaviors have talked about the persistence of courtship behaviors following, following bonding in a way that seems strange. I don't think it's strange at all. I think those kinds of behaviors and communicative gestures are ways of, of maintaining a bond. Right. Which leads us to the next question, and which is, uh, bonds among humans sometimes break. Mm -hmm. We see that, that with prairie voles, uh, and other animals who are not in lab situations. Yeah. I'm sure we do, but... Um, we do, else? we do. So, so, you know, pair bonds are more often than not about the successful rearing of young. And, uh, and so one of the ways that um, natural bonds break in the natural world, I mean, they can break because an individual dies. They can also break if the pair is unsuccessful in rearing young. And so among many birds, uh, the loss of a clutch can cause the dissolution of a bond. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so yeah, it's certainly, um, and, and then as I mentioned in parables, if they're, if they're apart from one another for, for 10 days or more, the bond can be dissolved. And so I think those proximity cues are ways of, of kind of figuring out the bond is still working, but there are other kinds of metrics that animals might use for deciding whether to maintain a bond. Mm -hmm. The next question, are there any studies on neural responses of pair bonding in apes, including humans, in addition to rodents? I, I mean, there have been a good number, uh, I mean, not an enormous number, but a, a significant number of fMRI studies. And they span from looking at how the brain responds to sexual touch, including orgasm, to looking how the brain responds at photographs of, loves, of loved ones, mm -hmm. to holding the hand of a partner, um, looking at individual differences in attachment styles and how those uh, are related to natural variation of brain activity. So, so there have been quite a few imaging studies. Um, you know, those imaging studies generally don't get at kind of the causal relationship between brain activity and bonds, but that's, but that's where the animal work informs us. Right. The, the next question is um, an interesting one. Your work describes the measurable external manifestations of bonds. How can we bridge the gap between this understanding of what bonds are and our subjective experience of bonding as humans? Can you repeat it one more time? Sure. Your work described the measurable external manifestations of bonds. How can we bridge the gap between this understanding of what bonds are and our subjective experience of bonding as humans, which is, I guess, much more complex? Yeah. So, uh, so I think, I mean, one way that we can bridge them, I mean, we can bridge, bridge them conceptually, and we can bridge them through brain work that suggests common circuitry, um, which then suggests, you know, it's a proc, I think of that common circuitry as a proxy or a, a guess that that suggests a similar experience in some way. But I don't mean to suggest that, that the human experience of bonding and relationships is equivalent to that in animals. In fact, I would say, <clears throat> but but I would say that um, what makes the human experience much richer is that kind of aspect of emotional contagion in which somebody's emotional state influences ours and that perception of oneness. I think where that stuff, I think where that comes from in the human experience is that because of our intellect, we can form really complex models of our partner's interior states and imagine what they're thinking and imagine how they're going to respond to something and try. And so when my husband is about to say something ridiculous that teases me, he gets a little look in the way he holds his lips. And I always know he's about to do it. Um, and or if I say something that upsets him, he has a way of kind of pausing and maybe looking away as he responds that those kind of subtleties are come from us having a very rich, very full model of a partner. And um, I think that richness is what distinguishes our experience, what distinguishes love from merely bonding. I think, I think love is bonding plus uh, 
this uh, complexity of appreciation for one another, complexity of, of assessment of each other. Right. Um, what does this work say about human tribalism and the hope of world peace? Another way to say it is, what is the role of aggression? So, uh, you know, in pair bonds, it's often the case that the formation, I mean, it's certainly the case in prairie voles, that the formation of a bond isn't only the formation of an attachment, it's also the emergence of territorial aggression in the species. And, uh, and psychologists talk about, you know, processes of in-group bias. We can think of those as being another category, a looser category of bonds. Um, and so, um, but those are remarkably flexible and, and probably some of the same mechanisms are going on. There, there have been, there's been work looking at oxytocin and other hormones on in-group bias and the ease of sort of assembling somebody into your group, but also the, the, the harshness with which you judge others that you don't know. And so, you know, I think they're not incompatible. And I think it kind of, um, I think what we have to, to do to, to, you know, have a, a more equitable world is to have one in which we find ways to include ourselves in a common group. Um, and I, you know, I think that's very plausible, um, but I don't think it, you know, it happens on its own. That's great. Um, the next question, so the listener says, I have a question about language. Many of the words that you used at the beginning of your talk to describe bonding in animals are identical to those used to describe human relationships, care, love, intimacy, etc. This more humanistic language tended to fall away when you expanded on the work your lab is doing. Are you working and writing in two distinct modes or trying to find ways to bridge the vernacular and the scientific? I, I, I think I'm doing both. I, I, you know, I think that, um, yeah, I mentioned in the introduction that I would occasionally sort of fall away from the details of what we know and get a little expansive. And I think that, you know, in a popular book or, or a talk to a general audience, I, I think that what we want from our science is not just a rigorous understanding of the world, but a sense in which that understanding creates meaning. And so I'm sort of toggling between these different modes of thinking or talking in which on one hand I'm talking you know about why bonds form or, or what brain regions work and I'm trying to be careful in my scientific language and other times I'm kind of talking more loosely um, in ways that you know probably some of my scientific colleagues would find objectionable but I, but I feel like um, I feel that if I'm speaking to a bigger group um, of people who are not specialists that connecting that scientific work to that deeper sense of meaning is one of the more useful things to do. And I, and I just think it's my responsibility to be open that that's what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, but I've, I've made a conscious decision um, not, to, uh, not, to, not to avoid the, that kind of language. Absolutely. This is all we have time today. Thank you, Stephen, for the fascinating presentation and your uh, insightful perspectives. I also want to thank you, the audience, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackley virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at rackley.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.